From May till September 1973, the British progressive rock band Jethro Tull toured the Americas and Britain promoting their sixth studio album, A Passion Play. Ian Anderson, Martin Barr, John Evan, Barrymore Barlow, and Jeffrey Hammond worked harder than ever to deliver a rendition of their newest concept album, mixing it with their characteristic virtuosity and quirky humor, and delivering an astounding live experience like never seen before. Welcome back to Rocky State, they say. And today we'll continue the series with episode 6, the Apache Play Tour stage setup. But before we start, please click the subscribe button and ring the bell, so you won't miss this channel's newest videos. And now let's start with the analysis. Jethro Tull always wanted to blow people's minds when the time of performing on stage came. They continued doing so like they did on the Aqualung or the Thick as a Brick tour. The technology used for this tour enhanced the live performance tenfold, and since the information available wasn't complete, I had to use the only info available and a bit of imagination. The stage experience for this tour has amazed audiences from 80 or so cities, and because of that, we'll see in detail what makes this stage experience so special. For this episode, I'll separate the analysis in two bigger parts, the story behind the album and the stage as such. The stage part will be separated in six different sections. Top lighting rig, bottom lighting rig, screen, projector and films, PA system, instruments and effects used in the tour, and additional equipment. Even before the release of Thick as a Break, the band spent most of 1972 touring in support of the new album, starting in Europe, then Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia and Japan, spanning from January to July of 1972. This would mark the beginning of a near three-month hiatus in the tour, during which the band did everything except taking holidays. One of the key factors that kept the band moving during this time was the criminal tax regime the UK had at the time, which would be as high as 83% for high earners, while on unearned income, the rate would be up to 98%. Unfortunately, the band fell on the second category. With the band eager to record new material, they set two criteria to pick up a place to record. This instance marked a record for Tall, as this new album would be the first one they would record with an unchanged lineup. Due to the abusive tax policies their homeland had, the band's accountants, who had employed tax advisors to examine the alternatives, suggested them to turn into non-residents for a while. So the first criterion was that they had to pick a studio abroad. And so they did. Encouraged by their manager, Terry Ellis, they started looking for countries to be residents of, and then packed their things. Barry wasn't happy at all with the choice, but had to oblige for the sake of the band. We'll talk about the second criterion later. The band chose Switzerland as their residence country, but before going there, they made a stopover in Mumbai. And here's when the project might be doomed from the very start as an alleged food poisoning situation ensued, making them plagued with recurring illness during the whole period. The entourage arrived to Montreux, where concert promoter Claude Noves helped them submit their request for Swiss citizenship. Not only that, he also found a rehearsal space for the band in an abandoned brick factory. During this period, Ian had some time learning soprano and sopranino saxes and now he felt confident enough to compose and perform the instrument in songs. It was August already, they were staying in an apartment that was also owned by Nubs, and during the early rehearsal stage, the first songs of the follow-up of Thick as a Brick started to gestate. 
but how do you outmatch yourself after composing a continuous 44 minute song with a double album of individual songs, of course? This was the plan, and Ian started developing several concepts for the album. Having had fun with the Quixote-like approach of their previous LP, the band thought it was time to be more serious and make an album that wasn't meant to be fun. The first theme that Anderson was developing is the parallels between human behavior and animal behavior. This concept was strongly influenced by the work of British zoologist Desmond Morris, which was one of Ian's favorite writers at the time, and especially The Naked Ape, from 1967. The intention behind this choice was writing an album that was exploring people, the human condition, through analogues with the animal kingdom, as Ian said some time later. Some songs written under this premise and that were rehearsed by the band include Animal E, Tiger Tune, Love the Bangle, Sea Lion, Bangle in the Jungle, and Animal Song, Hair's Spectacles, with music composed by Anderson and Evan and lyrics by Hammond. Keep track on that last one, as it will be important later on. The second theme is the use of the theater as a conceit for human life, a concept that the band was more than happy to explore, giving their approach to live performances and their elaborate stage shows. Some songs following this topic include Scenario, Audition, No Rehearsal, also known as The Bomb in the Dressing Room, Skating Away on the Thin Ice of the New Day, Critique of League, Left Right, and Oli Solitaire. The third theme that Anderson was working on was the critique of rock music journalism, which was a direct response to the critical backlash that the band was receiving in music periodicals throughout 1972. Some songs on which this topic is found include Oli Solitaire, Critique of League, and Love the Bangle. The fourth topic includes the concept of the afterlife, which would ultimately serve as the basis for the final version of A Passion Play as we know it. One of the first songs composed under this thematic is Sailor. In parallel with this songwriting process, and once the band had a substantial amount of songs under the sleeves, it was time to define the second criterion for recording this new material. The studio had to have a good reputation. The band put their sights in Strawberry Studios, a studio residence run by Michel Mann, which was located on the Chateau de Roville, a castle located 40 kilometers to the northwest of Paris, in France. The 18th century built castle started to earn a reputation from the hand of the Grateful Dead, who gave a concert at the Chateau in June 1971 after a performance in a free festival was ruined by the rain. A few months later, in January 1972, the castle housed Elton John, who recorded his now classical album Honky Chateau from 1972. And later in June, he stopped by again to record Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player from 1973. Other artists that used the studio that year include Pink Floyd, who from February to April 1972 recorded their seventh studio album, Obscured by Clouds, from 1972. T-Rex on recommendation of Elton John, recorded the basic tracks from their album The Slider in March 1972, and then they returned in August and then in October to record their album Tanks from 1973. And also, Cat Stevens stopped by in May to record his album Catch Bull at Four from 1972. With those big names under its belt, Strawberry Studios was chosen, and the Chateau de Roville would be their home for the month of September. So, before continuing, let's untangle this schedule mess. In January 1972, Elton John recorded Honky Chateau. From February till April 1972, Pink Floyd recorded Obscured by Clouds. In March 1972, T-Rex recorded part of the slider. In May 1972, Cat Stevens recorded Catch Pull at Four. In June 1972, Elton John recorded Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. In August 1972, T-Rex recorded Parts of Tanks. In September 1972, Jethro Tull recorded There. In October 1972, T-Rex returned to finalize the recording of Tanks. Why do I spend time explaining this? 
because it will be important for the story. The lads were very excited about it. What could go wrong with this renowned studio after all? Well, the choice was a complete disaster. First, as soon as the band decamped on Studio One, they found a myriad of technical problems with the equipment. It wasn't set up after its last visitors, some things were broken and hadn't been fixed, and the tape machines weren't aligned. Sound engineer Robin Black didn't realize this until they found out the machine had erased several tracks on the previously recorded tape, losing them. Once the maintenance guy arrived, he thought this situation was hilarious. The first backing tracks were in very rough state and didn't sound particularly good. Due to these problems, there were plenty of stop-start cycles, and because they were in the middle of nowhere, it was difficult to fix things right away, making the whole experience quite frustrating. There's a silver lining though, they were in the French countryside after all, so at least that was enjoyable, right? Actually, it was quite the opposite. When they got to their living quarters, they were dismayed by the conditions of the single bedroom they had. Everything was quite messy, and there was a bed tick infestation and dirty linen in the beds. As for the commodities, the 6,900 square meters or 1.7 acres property offered, they weren't in better shape either. According to Robbie Black, the pool was full of black flies, clear sign that it wasn't being cleaned up in a long while, but they still had the gardens and the tennis court. La Cuisine Francaise wasn't particularly good for them either. According to the lads, there was a bearded woman who was in charge of the cooks, and soon after the first meals, everybody fell ill, worsening the symptoms they had carried since their visit to Mumbai. It would soon become a problem, because sometimes they would be in the middle of a take, and someone had to drop their instrument and run to the bathroom as fast as they could without splattering themselves. Martin said in recent years that sometimes they didn't even know the origins of the meat they were eating, saying that they probably ate every song bear in the book. And he also complained about the wine, saying that it came in unlabeled bottles and that it was full of fruit flies. Jeffrey has also said that the only time he knowingly ate horse meat was at the chateau and he did it just by curiosity. He also complained about the soup, saying that the only day it was fresh was in Mondays, and then the leftovers were mixed with soup made the day after, and so on and so on until Sunday. Very soon after, they asked the lady to only cook for them omelette and chips. Literally, at breakfast, omelette and chips. At lunch, omelette and chips. At dinner, omelette and chips. This was done on the basis that she could not poison them with omelette and chips, and this somehow worked. With these experiences on their backs and all the technical difficulties, they kept on recording, and by September 10th, the band had recorded the first sign of the new album, which was about the afterlife and the theater concept, including the songs The Big Top, Scenario, Audition, Skating Away on the Thin Ice of the New Day, Sailor and no rehearsal. By September 15th, the second side of the album was recorded, which included the songs Left Right, Only Solitaire, and Critique of Leak Parts 1 and 2. By September 25th, the band had already recorded the third side of the album, which was about the animal concept, including the songs Animally, First and Second Dances, Animal Songs, Hair's Spectacles, Love the Bungle, Part 1. Tiger Toon and Law of the Bungle Part 2. The pace the band was having was impressive given the circumstances. However, their Swiss residency process went much more smoothly, as one night Claude Knobs called Ian to say him this, it's Claude from Montreux, congratulations, I'd just like to be the first to tell you that your Swiss residency has been passed by the canton of Bob, you are now Swiss residents. To which Ian responded, OK, well, I'll go and tell the other guys. Ian called a quick meeting with the rest of the band and told them, against all odds, we are residents of Switzerland, so we can be tax exiles and can save a lot of money. 
but morale within the group began to wane with all the menagerie of things that happened during their stay, and the personal sacrifices they had to do, and started to become homesick. They all said pitifully, we want to go home. Because of this, the fourth side of the double album was never recorded. Fun fact, because of all this drama, these sessions and the studio were nicknamed Chateau Disaster by Anderson and Chateau de Rouville by Barry. Because they were now officially living in Switzerland, they didn't have to worry about the tax policy anymore, and they promptly came back to the UK. It was upon their return that they decided to lock away the tapes for good and start over with a new concept. But their touring commitments forced them to come back to the US by mid-October, and totally jaded, they used those two weeks they had to rest and prepare for their second American leg, on which certain songs like The Play, also known as The Spill, also also known as Left Right, The Bomb in the Dressing Room, also known as No Rehearsal, Audition, and sometimes Animal Song, Hair's Spectacles, were introduced to their audiences. This is an indicator that they might have loved the recording experience, but they thought the material had potential anyways. Let's fast forward five months in time, to the end of their European leg in late March 1973 to be precise. The lads decided to finish their concert commitments before resuming work on their new album. This time, Ian decided to repeat the formula he used for Thick as a Brick and wrote another continuous piece of music, this time lasting 45 minutes. They had around one month before their debut presentations at the Empire Pool on April 28th and 29th. Ian, knowing he wouldn't be able to ignore the previously composed songs, rearranged quite a few pieces from the Chateau sessions and merged them to make the skeleton of the new album. He then put over his lyrics about the afterlife, and here's when Ronnie Pilgrim was born. In this manner, Tiger Tune was rearranged and renamed as Prelude, followed by new pieces called The Silver Chord, Reassuring Tune, and Memory Bank. Critique of League was rescued from the Chateau Sessions, rearranged and reinstalled in the concept as the latter half of Memory Bank, Best Friends, and Critique of League. For the second half, there were several song sections from different ideas which were merged into songs, and the foot of our stairs. Overseer Overture, Flight from Lucifer, 1008 to Paddington, Magus Perde and Epilogue were born. Ian composed the songs, mind you, but everyone participated in the arrangements. With this idea, they headed to Morgan Studios to officially start the album sessions. With so little time to finish it, the sessions usually ended in the early morning. A few weeks later, almost everything was ready and it was decided that Animal Song, Hair's Spectacles, was now a part of the album, working as a, an interlude. So, in the studio, said song was spliced and cut directly from the Chateau tapes, and inserted in the master tape of the Morgan Sessions, giving birth to the story of the hair who lost his spectacles. Over that same tape, Dee Palmer, then David Palmer, composed an orchestral arrangement and conducted the orchestra overdubbed directly on set tape. Two connecting pieces were composed to give continuity and to make a more seamless transition between the interlude and Ronnie's story, and so Forest Dance 1 and 2 were born, recorded and integrated into the project. The intro sequence we hear in the album was done by Chris Amsel, one of Tool's sound engineers, in the same fashion that the big top was made. He had acquired an EMS Synthi AKS synthesizer recently, and one day he and Ian would meet to play around and record a little sound collage at the start, but Anderson couldn't make it, so it was just Amazon and the assistant tape operator for that session. Here's where the classical heartbeat and odd soundscapes which composed live beats were born, from which he asked to do the same for the live shows. Other overdubs were added on Prelude, Forest Dance 1 and 2, Overseer Overture, and Epilogue. This frenetic working schedule added to the preparation of the visual aspects of the presentation, 
Lip Chuyen suffering from nervous exhaustion, so the late April dates were postponed two months, to late June to be precise. Ian was ordered to rest for a while, so the tour moved over to the North American leg. The album cover theme revolved around the concepts of death and rebirth, with pictures taken by Brian Ward, who portrayed a young ballerina called Jane Colthorpe. Fun fact, during the interviews and rehearsal process, Ian and Jane started dating, and then the two were a couple for a little more than a year. This was done at the end of a two-day film recording session, when she was asked to pose for both photographs, which she agreed to do. The front cover, portraying death, was taken at the Duke of York's Theatre in London. After a few pose rejections, James provided the final pose, and with fake blood and a hidden dead leaf that Jane was holding, the image was taken. The back cover, portraying rebirth, was taken in an unknown photographic studio. Ian wanted this photo to look joyful and uplifting, and from all the poses, the arabesque one was chosen. Again, Jane had a flower on the left hand, but wasn't noticeable on the final image. A Passion Play was released on July 13, 1973, and the set list was this. After writing and recording the album, Jethro Tull focused on the life experience, and started overseeing different aspects of the show, with enhancements that soon would prove to be successful. For this occasion, I'll consider a part of the tour the first dates after the recording of the album, all the way to the end of the presentations for that year. As it happened on the previous tour, the promotion of the new album started months before the album itself was released and included introductory and intermission films, their classical skits with the telephone calls, guitar, drum and flute solos, their first approaches to click tracks and cues with the tape machines, among other pleasant surprises. To test all this, the band booked rehearsal time at ELP's Manticore headquarters to rehearse the stage performance. The band started their tour in Evansville, USA on May 4th, 1973, and though this fact is quite true, it's still not entirely clear when a passion play was given its live premiere. On this first date, the live beats intro audio was used without the film, but this led directly into Thick as a Brick, completely skipping a passion play. Also during this concert, the hair interval film was shown out of context, but unfortunately broke down. More omissions ensued in the following dates, until allegedly on May 9th was the last concert featuring the late Thick as a Brick tour setlist. The first verified performance of this new stage show was on May 13th in Knoxville, USA. The tour finished in Boston, USA on September 29th, 1973. The tour consisted of 80 concerts in USA, Canada and the UK between May and September of 1973. The top lighting rig was composed of four truss structures, from which approximately 160 lighting fixtures were hung. All of the lights used in this stage were par 64 lights, with color gels in front of them. So, based on all the scarce multimedia material available, the top lighting rig should be placed in this order. We can divide this section in three parts, the front lighting rig, the rear lighting rig, and the side lighting ladders. In the front row we have six lights pointing to the van, 
divided on five subgroups of 12 lights, each pointing to a band member. Each subgroup contained two magenta lights, two green lights, two yellow lights, two blue lights, two red lights, and two white lights. In the rear row, we also have 60 lines pointing to the band, divided on five subgroups of 12 lights, each pointing to a band member. Each subgroup contained two magenta lights, two green lights, two yellow lights, two blue lights, two red lights, and two white lights. In the lighting ladders, we have 40 lights in total, and they're separated into 8 green lights, 8 yellow lights, 8 blue lights, and 8 red lights. The bottom lighting rig for this tour consisted of approximately 61 lights in total, and it was a literal copy of their previous tour's rig. This section includes 54 par 36 lights distributed in a 1 to 2 ratio, including 18 blue lights, 18 red lights, and 18 yellow lights. 3 parabolic lights, 2 for Ian and 1 for the telephone stool. 4 strobe lights. For this tour, the band decided to include a film screen to show some complimentary footage they worked on. The screen the band used was a retractable one, measuring 7.7 .7 meters or 25.3 feet in width and 5.5 meters or 18 feet in height, and it was placed around 1.7 meters or 5.6 feet from stage level when fully deployed. As a visual element, it was one of the first things that caught the attention of the crowd during this tour. In the live show ecosystem, this element is one of the most important ones, and was complemented by a 35 mm projector, on which three pieces of footage were shown at the beginning, the intermission, and the end of the song. An accompanying follow spotlight fixture was also used to give atmospheric effects, synchronizing with the EMS Synthi AKS heartbeats played before each presentation. How all of this work must be explained, because it's so cool. But first, I need to talk about the film's production, so bear with me. At the start of February, the band took a one-month break after the first three concerts of the European leg to work exclusively in the two pieces of film. The band auditioned Jane Colfort as their main ballerina, alongside another ballerina just known to us as Jeannie. Jane has said that Ian was really sure of what he wanted in the hair film, one of the main highlights of it being the maple dance. Jane, being a professional ballerina, helped Ian with the choreography. She had to teach this choreography to everyone who was involved in the shooting, and for this process, the crew had up to 12 days of rehearsals, and two days of filming. The first location selected to record was Burnham Beaches, a park located in London, and where the outdoor scenes, both day and night shots, were filmed. The indoor shots were taken at the Rainbow Theatre. During the stairs chase, Jane cut her sheen, and it was left on the final cut. Her vocal overdub was done sometime later in a studio in Soho, London. Something wonderful is happening. The intro and outro films were shot by Ian at Lee International Film Studios, using a high-speed camera operating at about 180 frames per second. Anderson filmed Jane lying on the floor, and then started moving her hands. Then suddenly, from the abdomen alone, she lifted her torso off the floor and gradually rose to her feet, starting to dance. The next shot showed Jane passing through a mirror, also recorded at a high frame rate. When editing, the film was reproduced at high speed, making an eerie effect and the only moment when it runs at normal speed is when the ballerina runs at the mirror. Now, 
how all of this worked together, around 20 minutes before the start of the show, and along with the subsonic beats, a small dot, around 30 cm or 12 inch in diameter, appeared in the center of the screen, and along with the rhythm, it flashed, each time bigger, up until a point where it filled the whole screen and turned red. It was at this moment that the still image of the ballerina appeared, and for a few minutes it looked like she was just staring to the camera, and then she starts moving, and people did lose it when she lifted from her abdomen, stood and started to dance. During all this time, John would be playing Moog Swirls, hidden from view by a black curtain. It was an extravagant and amazing way to start a show. The hair film was more straightforward, and lasting around 7 minutes, it was intriguing for the audiences. The band opted out of playing both for stance pieces, which led in and out of the hair segment. For the outro part, the film that accompanied it showed the ballerina shattering the mirror, and doing an arabesque pose, turning from black and white into color. The band's PA system, as well as the bottom lighting rig, was kept almost unchanged since the last tour. The band continued working with their Tycho Break cabinets and amps, but this time the band changed their mixing console, which was an old model with knobs instead of fades, and which was acquired from the Beach Boys to a 30-channel Alice mixing desk. Another addition to the arsenal was Chris Amson's EMS AKS synth, on which he would break the beats that appeared on the album's intro. Around 20 minutes before the show's start, he would start playing with the lowest C note he could achieve, which was outside the hearing range of a human being, and slowly creep up through the octaves. At the same time, the small light dog would appear on the screen. This tour also debuted a way to make sonic cues. With the help of Chris Amson and Dave Morris, they devised a way to make a remote start button for a Reebok A77 reel-to-rig tape player, and the tape had several sound cues with feeder tape in between. So, as soon as a cue finished, a tape operator was in charge to win the machine right at the beginning of the next one. Some elements will be repeated when analyzing the year, but here we'll talk about them as a whole. The final PA included. 12 Tycho Break cabinets, each made from an 18-inch bass horn, a 2x15-inch cabinet, and a tweeter horn, two 8x12-inch monitor cabinets, a HiWatt SC4123 monitor cabinet, two 4x12-inch monitor cabinets, six Tycho Break VFA 2000 amps, an Alice 30-channel mixing desk, two Revox a77 reel to reel tape players, one used and another as a spare, an EMS Synthi AKS synthesizer, a Vincent Ecorec T7E unit. This tour featured new instruments and effects which transformed the already amazing sound the band made. To make a complete analysis of the band's live sound, I've separated this section in five, one subsection for each band member. Ian used the exact same instruments that he used on the previous tour, with the sole exception of the soprano and sopranino saxophones he acquired before the recording. So, his list of instruments included a Martin 016-NY acoustic guitar, three Artley traverse flutes, one main and two spares, a soprano sax, a sopranino sax, a tambourine, a custom three-switch pedal board, one button was acquired to the Vincent and controlled the delay. Another would turn on and off and control the vibrato speed. And the third would be the remote start button for the tape machine. A pillow with pants and shoes sewed on, 
on which the acoustic guitar would rest when not played, his PA system included a Shure SM56 microphone for vocals and flute, a condenser microphone for the guitar, two pickup microphones for the saxophones, two 4 by 12 inches monitor cabinets. For this tour, Martin didn't make any changes in his gear, which was composed by a Gibson Les Paul Sunburst Standard, a Hiwat Custom 100 amp head, two Hiwat SE4123 4x12 inches cabinets, a red travel booster effect pedal made by Hornbein's Cues, which was a clone of the Dallas Rangemaster. According to him, it would pick up radio signals when used. His PA included an 8 by 12 inch cabinet, John's gear grew a bit more for this tour. During 1972, the only instruments he had were the organ and the piano, but by early 1973, he had acquired a Moog Mini Moog, and by mid-1973, he had acquired a second unit, both mounted on top of the organ. Also, he changed the model of his organ. His setup included a Hammond organ B3, a Steinway Model D-274 Grand Piano, two Moog Mini Moog Model D synthesizers, a Leslie L122 speaker cabinet, a WEM Audio Master Mixer, a Solid State Preamp Unit, a Hiwat Custom 100 Amp Head, Barry's drum kit was kept the same for this tour. His setup was displayed in a drum finish. All his drums were Ludwig, all his cymbals were Pasty 2002, and the final kit was like this, which included a 24 by 14 inch bass drum, a 22 by 14 inch bass drum, 13 by 9 inches and 14 by 10 inches toms, 16 by 16 inch, 18 by 16 inch and 20 by 18 inch floor toms, a 6 by 14 inch snare drum, a 7 inch splash cymbal, a 20 inch Formula 602 right cymbal, an 18 inch crash cymbal, a 16 inch crash cymbal, 15 inch hi-hat cymbals, a glockenspiel, a cowbell, Jeffrey's gear wasn't affected very much by the new tour. The only substantial changes were the change in several monitoring stacks he had on stage and the enveloping of his bass guitar in aluminum foil. The gear he used included two acoustic 360 amp heads, two acoustic 360 amp cabinets, two Fender jazz bass guitars, and two by 18 inch folded bass horn, a Twitter horn, a 20 inch gong. His PA included a high watt SE4123 4 by 12 inch cabinet, an 8 by 12 inch cabinet.
two silver masks representing the drama of life were hung high above the stage level, at least 7 meters or 23 feet. Each one of them measured 1.5 by 2.4 meters or 4.9 by 8 feet and were shaped to portray tragedy and comedy, respectively. This might be a product of their love for theater or a wink to one of the embryonic ideas for the album. A telephone was set up atop a wooden stool. This telephone was wired to a trigger box, which would make the telephone ring when desired. The purpose of this was to create a comedic skit after the encore, on which the telephone would ring and wouldn't be picked up. Two flash boxes were put at either side of the stage, and were used for the first introductory chords of a passion play. Besides, smoke machines were placed around the stage, helping the band with their performances. Despite the amount of concerts, the only two European dates of the tour were in England, and would mark the beginning of a 16-month hiatus away from European halls, up to October 1974. As was usual during this time, some sections of a passion play were extended by several minutes to allow some improvisational passages, and even a segment of My God was inserted during August to replace the foot of our stairs, followed by a keyboard solo that led to the last verse of the latter movement. This allowed the piece to last from the original 45 minutes the song lasts to close to an hour. This repeated during the second half of the set, after Thick as a Brick. Songs like Aqualang and Cross-Eyed Mary were extended with skits, extemporizations and instrumental pieces. Due to the increase in popularity that the band experienced, thanks to Thick as a Brick, they stopped playing in theaters and small auditoriums and started playing in arenas and concert halls. Their PA system soon became rather wimpy, and the band was forced to add more and more amps and cabinets to their amplification system, going from 4 in early 1972 to 10 by the end of the year. 12 by 1973, and 24 by the end of the tour. The amp count increased as well, getting up to 12 amps for their rig. By 1974, the band had upgraded their PA system to make up for this issue. Did the band use the gong that was on stage, or it was simply a decorative item? The band actually used the gong in one of their skits, immediately after John made a kazoo-like sound with the Moog synth. <laughs> According to Ian, there was an instance where the rabbit suits the band used caused somewhat of a hassle during a show in the early stages of the tour. The band appeared on stage wearing their costumes, and the plan was this. Considering that each rabbit suit had a zip in the back, and after a bit of wild dancing to the taped intro music, they would line up one in front of the other, and each rabbit would unzip their rabbit in front. The musicians would burst out of the rabbit suits playing their instruments, and the live show would begin. This choice was a comical disaster, as the zips jammed on two of the rabbit suits. The road crew struggled with the suits and ended up cutting the musicians free with box knives. On June 30th, 1973, and roughly one week after the band's shows in London, an appalling concert review appeared on Melody Maker. Oh yes, the infamous Chris Welch review published under the name A Crime of Passion. In the two-page column, Welch expressed more disappointment rather than distaste, qualifying the music as poor, cold and unemotional, complaining about the show's intro and saying the lyrics did not communicate one weight and qualified them as baffling. This was applicable only to a passion play, 
having no problem with the rest of the set. Several musical journals, like the New Musical Express, followed suit, starting a snowball effect, as you'll soon see. When asked about it, Welch responded that it was time for the band to get a stinker review, to show that they weren't teaming up with Tall to make them look good, admitting that it wasn't that bad as he originally said. As was expected, the response the press had about the show transpired into the album itself, causing even more press backlash. Magazines like Rolling Stone, Melody Maker, The New Musical Express, and Cream had bad things to say about the album, and in the end, with all the negative reviews, it sadly transformed in their first unanimous critical failure. But despite that, the album sold incredibly well, peaking at number 13 in the UK, number 5 in Germany and Norway, and number 1 in the United States and Canada. What a way to shut the critics up! Terry Ellis and Melody Maker's editor, Ray Coleman, put up a publicity stunt to get Jethro Tull in the front cover of said magazine again, due to release on August 25th. The stunt was quite dramatic, saying that as soon as the tour ended, the band would stop giving live performances indefinitely, appalled by the critiques to their latest project. The statement Ellis communicated said, and I quote, the abuse heaped upon the show by the critics has been bitterly disappointing to the group, and as illogical as it may be to identify the opinions of the reviewers with those of the public, it has become increasingly difficult for the group to go on stage without worrying whether the audience are enjoying what they are playing. There's a little detail though. Terry forgot to tell the band about this. The way they found out was from Ian, who was getting out of the subway on his way to the Chrysalis offices, and passed by a new paper stand. He glanced at it, then did a double take on something that caught his attention. In the Melody Maker cover there was a picture of him with the title, Jethro Retire Hort. He couldn't believe it, so he went straight to face Ellis. When asked about it, Terry said, Oh, yes. I meant to mention it to you, it slipped my mind, but don't worry about it, Ray's okay, it's all a nod and wink stuff. Now you have to go back and say you didn't quit. Ian was absolutely furious about it, and never gave that interview. The band used a Douglas DC-4 airplane to move the tour equipment between cities in the United States. The original album packaging included a little booklet the now famous and satirical six-page lingual theater program, on which there were fictional characters portrayed by the members of the band, and the only instance where Ronnie Pilgrim was named. Costs of filming the Hair's film segments were established at a whopping £12,000, or £116,222 in today's costs. Some people who starred in the films included individuals like the ballerinas Jane Colthorpe and Ginny, Jane's mom Doreen as the tea lady, Eric Brooks as the berserk cameraman, Robin Black as Hippo, Van Rodis, Dave Morris as Kangaroo, and Fraser Atkins as Gorilla, respectively. It also included Ian Anderson as Newt and the clipboard guy, Martin Barr as Owl, John Evan as Hair and the Introducer, Barrymore Barlow as B, and Jeffrey Hammond as the Narrator. This is one of the least documented tours the band ever went on. There are no official audio releases, and the only snippets of video officially released are part of a promo video for the third hurrah. The album was re-released in 1988, in 2003, and in 2014. As a side note, the album was a victim of censorship by Franco's dictatorship in Spain, first being rejected by the committee and then approved after Phonogram SA's insistence. The Chateau tapes were shelved for 15 years, with the exception of Skating Away and Sea Lion, which were released in War Child. 
and then issued parts of it in 1988 on the box set 20 Years of Jethro Tull, the definitive collection, and in a revised, more complete version on Nightcap, the unreleased masters, 1973 to 1991, in 1993. It had flute passages performed by a 46-year-old Anderson, who thought it was something required to hide the embryonic nature of the recordings. In 2014, the complete tape collection was released alongside a passion play, with all the 1993 overdubs erased. Despite all, the band played Critique of League during the War Child and Minstrel tours, and a few more times in the future after the original incarnation that recorded this album ceased to exist. But what did we learn on this occasion? That this tour succeeded when we talk about the band keeping their playful and impressive approach to live performances. But however, one can have the best stage show in the world, but if a piece is overarranged and overcooked, it won't make it any more digestible. The band learned from their mistakes and used all that experience to work on their next project, War Child, which would initially be a film and album combo. So, thanks a lot for watching this video, and while I make the other stage videos, just keep watching the rest of this series and the content in my channel. If you have a suggestion for a stage tour analysis, just let me know, I'll make it for you and I'll put you in the credits. I can't thank enough to Atomic Torchlight, Remy Tena and Tall Tapes. Without their help, this video wouldn't have been possible. Please join to my Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts and follow all these projects while they're in the creation phase. See you next time and have a great day!